Welcome to Off Duty. I'm Wendy Benz. We are gearing up to celebrate the World Series here at the Wall Street Journal, celebrating our national pastime baseball, which is why I need our sports editor, Mr. Sam Walker. Say How hi are to you? Fans. Hello. Hello. You wrote a book on baseball. I did. It's called Fantasyland. It's you should know a lot about being a good fan. I, I'd like to think so, but you know, you're never sure. You're going to teach me a few ways. You're going to teach all of us a few ways in just a minute. I hope I don't have to buy a lot of tickets. I can't afford it. No, no tickets. No involved. tickets. All right, we'll get back to that in a minute. But first, I want to talk grass. Wish your lawn could look like this? Well, we're going to show you how to stripe your lawn like the pros at Fenway Park, the oldest baseball park in America. But first, talk about old. The Louisville Slugger Bat has been around for more than 120 years. And for the first time ever, you can buy the same quality slugger as some of your heroes in the major leagues. Here's how they're made. What baseball icon has more base hits, more RBIs, and more home runs than any other icon in baseball history? Well, it's not a who, it's a what. The Louisville Slugger. Now I'm here at the Louisville Slugger factory with Matt Bynum, and he's gonna tell us a little bit about a new series of Louisville Sluggers that are coming out. Now, you guys have been making bats for 128 years. Correct, 1884. Right. And so, what could there possibly be new? I mean, it's just wood, right? In a general sense, you're right. The two species that we make pretty much every professional baseball bat with are ash and sugar maple, or hard maple. What are the differences between the new bat and, say, the old bat? The big difference is that the MLB prime family of wood bats is everything that a professional baseball player would ever want in a Louisville Slugger bat except we are offering that in a retail setting. Everything you would find in an MLB Prime bat is everything we would offer a professional baseball player other than it doesn't have Derek Jeter's name on it. With all of the new technology and all the new materials and everything, why are they still made out of wood? They are made out of wood and they will always be made out of wood because that is what Major League Baseball stipulates as one of their rules. It's very clearly stated in their rules that a baseball bat that is used by a professional player must be made of a single piece of solid wood. This is the Louisville Slugger Museum that we're in right now. Can yes. you tell us a little bit about the history of the company and how Louisville Slugger became a legend? Well, we first started as a wood shop. We made, you know, uh, bed posts, rolling pins. My great, great, great grandfather started it back in, I do believe, 1854. Mm -hmm. uh, his son, Bud Hill, John A. Hiller I, or Bud Hiller as everyone called him, was an uh, amateur baseball player. And as the story goes, he was skipping work one day and uh, went to a game watching Pete Browning play. Pete Browning broke his bat. After the game, uh, Bud went up to him, asked him if he could make him a new bat. They, uh, the story goes, they spent the day making a new bat. The next day, he went uh, three for three. And that's how we started. So I'm gonna put the magic goggles on, and you're gonna give us a little tour about how the bat is actually made. All of our pro bats in MLB Prime, all the wood for it starts right here. This is our sorting area. Uh -huh. uh, basically, a bundle of wood will come in from the from the mills. Then a grader will come in, start grading each individual piece of wood, determining whether it is pro quality or not, weigh it off, and sort it into the different uh, slots. Then our turners will come back here, select wood from each bin, and take it up to the uh, lathe to turn it. This is our Locatelli CNC lathe. Got it from Italy back in 2003. Basically ran as a giant computer. Each program is brought into it as uh, files, and uh, by touch of a couple buttons on the keyboard over there, you can switch from model to model. After bat's turn, it's taken over here to combination. Basically, we start the sand sanding process. Take a bat, you put it in the sander, and it goes through five different rows of sandpaper. It then comes out the backside where the worker picks it up, cuts off the nubs, the ends are sanded smooth, and then on another machine, we cut the bat if it's required to be cupped. Next, all bats go through a filler process, like on this line here. Yeah. They're actually brought back here to be pad printed. That's where the oval is put on, in the center of the bat. When the bats are uh, out of the finish area, they come over to our laser engraving area, where the front brands and the back brands are put on the bat. Oh, okay. They are then uh, paint filled they are then stickered, boxed, and ready to ship out. 
we have our own MLB prime bat for you. Just for off duty? Just for off duty. Our own Louisville slugger. Even a Mets fan might be able to hit something with this. Oh, that hurt, Walker. I'm a Mets fan. I'm <sighs> painful. Look at this bat. It's beautiful. I mean, it's really something. Maybe Can a I hold your bat? You may. Maybe A-Rod needs to borrow that. He might start hitting again. He's a lucky bat. Had to get that in. Come on, he was ragging on the Mets. Do you have a lawn? I, I do have a lawn. It's not striped. You've not yeah, striped it right But like I'm, I'm really thinking I might stripe it now. Amazing it's patterns great. they do on those fields, right? It's pretty amazing. So you're going to be jealous about this. I went to Fenway Park. I got a total lesson in how to strike your lawn. Really? Like the major leagues. Wow. Did you get to shag some balls while you were out there? I did. I was pretty good. Yeah. Let's take a look. Nice. <laughs> Welcome to Off Duty. We are here in historic Fenway Park. It is the home to the Boston Red Sox. It is also the oldest baseball park in America. And we are standing next to the guy who is lucky enough to come to work here every day, Dave Miller. He's the director of grounds. What's a better job than this? There isn't one. This is just the best. And you are, you are the guy, basically, who is the godfather of striping. And that is the phenomenon that we all see, the patterns on the field. How different is striping from stadium to stadium? Well, patterns are only limited by your imagination. Certainly at this level, safety and playability is our first priority. But whether it's a tr traditional checkerboard or something festive like the Sox logo, it's about having fun too. And it's not something you just have to have professional equipment to do. Homeowners can do it too, and you're gonna teach us that a little bit later in the show. But for people who don't actually know what striping is and how it happens, you're not coloring the grass, you're, you're bending the grass. Correct. A light stripes mode away from you in a dark stripes mode toward you. You think of velvet or velour, if you round your fingers against it, you're changing the nap of the grass. And so it's just about uh, mowing in a certain direction that reflects that light differently on the grass. Now, this is mostly for the enjoyment of the people in the stands or the people watching on TV, because you can't see it as much when you're on the field, is that right? And it certainly doesn't affect play. Correct, that's the goal for it, not to affect play, but certainly on TV or higher up, you, you certainly see the patterns more then. Sounds just like it does on TV. Now, some people put all these fancy degrees on their walls. I think you've done better. This is your artwork. These are all fields you've striped. Well, I'm fortunate to have a great staff, but yeah, this is kind of a collaboration of artwork we've done on fields throughout the year. Tell us about a few of them. Well, this is a tartan plaid that came uh, as an inspiration from an Argyle uh, sweater I saw. When Bruce Springsteen was here, we actually wrote Bruce on the infield and made the B a Red Sox B. Is he a Red Sox fan? Well, he, I think he was that day. He was that day. <laughs> what happens if you make a mistake? You know, it's very easy to fix. If you make a mistake, it's nothing to worry about. Just go back to the previous line before and start over. That's it. Just That's roll it. it the other way. It's absolutely. You just start with that fresh edge and you just start right over. Let's walk over and check out the Toro Triplex Real Mower. It has three cutting units on it, two in the front and one underneath the seat. And they're real mowers, very much like the, the old time push mowers you would see your father's using. And there's a roller in the front that helps stand up the grass with these grooves. The units then cut behind it, and behind the cutting unit is a roller that helps bend in that design. And the roller, and the roller is what basically makes the striping pattern because it's flattening the blades one way or the other and the light reflects off of that. Absolutely. Any mower will make a pattern in the grass with its tires and its blade, but the rollers really help etch in that design. 65,000 square feet of Kentucky bluegrass here in the outfield. That's about how big, an acreage? About an acre and a half. Acre and a half. So many homeowners might have that, and if they want to try this themselves, is this the one of the machines they would use to do it? This is the perfect machine for them. It's a Simplicity Lawn and Garden tractor, and the back of the deck has rollers on it, so it follows any contours in your lawn, so it can't scalp. But what's great about it also is those rollers are just like the rollers on the expensive equipment here, and they're going to put a pattern in your lawn while you mow. And how short are you cutting the grass here, and how short should homeowners cut it? Because it's different. That's a great question. We're mowing at an inch and a quarter here. Homeowners should be mowing between two and a half and three and a half inches because that extra grass blade is going to shade the roots so it doesn't dry out as quickly. And, you know, they don't have to worry about playability issues. So I would encourage them to mow high 
and mow often. So they're following what's called the one third rule. They're never cutting off more than one third at a time, so they're not out there bailing hay basically in their yard. <laughs> and you mentioned a lot of these tips in your book. It's what picture perfect mowing techniques for lawns, landscapes, and sports. It's all in here patterns, tips, all of that. Absolutely. Turf 101, but if you want to mow like the majors, the information's right there step by step instructions. And in fact, it teaches you how to make your own roller at home. If you go to a lawnmower repair shop, they're going to have a graveyard of mowers behind the store that uh, they have lawnmower handles on. And then we just take PVC pipe and you can cut it to whatever length you want and we fill it with concrete. We make end caps out of, uh, out of plywood to hold it in there, find the center point, put your bolt on, and then you can just connect it. That's gonna help put that pattern in your lawn and add to that curbside appeal. And now the one thing I've always wondered too is how do you keep your lines so straight? I mean, I've always imagined you're, you're out here with like string or whatever, or somebody on the sidelines, but it doesn't seem like that's the case. Well, certainly if we're doing a, a unique pattern like the Sox logo, we'll measure that out. But otherwise, a homeowner can use the side of the driveway or pick a point in the distance, like a, a window, a tree, a shrub, and mow toward it. That's what we do. We'll pick a point on the wall pad or on the track and mow toward it. Well, lucky for us, the Sox are on the road right now. They don't mind if we play around with the patterns a little bit, do they? I don't think so. I think, in fact, you can help. I can help. Moment of truth, striping the oldest ballpark in America. Hope I don't mess up. Oh, have fun. All right. Well, think you're a good baseball fan. Uh, you can always be better. The man to teach you, Sam Walker, sports editor of the Wall Street Journal. How are you going to do this? You give us all free tickets. That's going to make us better Free fans. tickets. <laughs> free tickets. There's going to test after this segment, too. So are you yep. ready for that? All right. I'm okay. going to write it down on my Louisville slugger here. All right. Number one. The number one rules, it all starts with the official rules of Major League Baseball, right? You want to take these and you want to chuck them. <laughs> Right? Why is that? Because the rule book is a complete disaster. It was written 60 or more than 60 years ago by a PR guy in the commissioner's office. And it wasn't the rules as much as all these weird contingencies for things that like will happen once, like running the bases in reverse order, or pitchers like wearing glass buttons to distract the hitter. So there's all these crazy arcane rules in there, and it's very hard to understand. The second rule, watch the local TV broadcasts. As opposed so, to the national and ones. Ra and don't do ra radio is a little harder because they got to tell you what's happening. So they don't have a lot of time for asides to sort of explain the game. If you get the package, the MLB extra innings, right. or you know, watch some of the local broadcasts of other teams because sometimes they'll get into long asides that will help you learn a little bit about the game. The other thing is Twitter and live blogs, which we do a lot of here. That it's actually kind of a cool thing for learning because if something happens in real time, you can check into Twitter and see what people are saying That's about it. Point. So you don't have to wait till the next morning to see if it's in the paper. No offense to papers, <laughs> of course. Another one is treat yourself to expensive seats sometime. Seriously. When you say expensive, I mean, they can be good oh, yeah. seats. I mean, you can pay upward $300, $400. Oh, yeah. no, you get into all the clubs, you get to eat, you get to drink, but yeah. you're going to pay for that too. Before you understand anything, you want to see how fast those pitches are because it's unbelievable. And, and to see how they hit the ball, how much spin there is on the ball, and to watch, see how quick these guys are making plays, it just gives you more appreciation for the athleticism and for how a routine play is not so routine. If you want to be a baseball fan, go to spring training. It's fun, it's warm, we all know that. But there's this great trick, which is go buy a general admission ticket. You don't have to go to a fancy team or one of the big teams. Go behind the plate and you'll see a bunch of guys with radar guns. <laughs> and it's the scouts. And these yeah. are major league scouts, some of the best scouts in all the organizations. Now, all right, we're getting a little arcane here, but they're board games. If you really want to learn, okay, there's yeah. Stratomatic and there's this game called APBA, A-P-B-A, which is something that uh, a lot of people used to play. It's not very popular anymore. But it's really where you actually run a game and you have to manage the team. Give us a couple of books to read. Read Bill James' Baseball Abstracts, but you got to do the 80s. Go back and read the vintage ones. There's also a book that I kind of like. It's called um, Watching Baseball Smarter by Zach Campbell. And what I really like about it is chapter 10 is all this random stuff that people always ask you, like, well, where do these names come from? Why do they always scratch themselves? Why do they put a K up when there's a strike? Yeah. It's all those things that, that a lot of people don't know. It makes you a smarter baseball fan. Well, it, yeah, and it just takes a little of the mystery out of it. Fantasy baseball is a last resort. You wrote a book about fantasy baseball. Yes. Why are you saying it's a last resort? Because <laughs> it's addictive and it'll make you weird and it'll make you do things you're not proud of. You heard it from Sam Walker, things you're not proud of. All right, Sam. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you.